England's Richard Folds is one of the world's great all-round shotgunners. He's been successful at the highest level at both IWSF and, of course, Sporting Clays. In my opinion, Richard makes shotgun shooting look easier than anyone else on earth. We continue on in our Week of Champions Part 2. We've got a guy with us today all the way from England. Early morning for him, late at night for us. Richard Folds, great to see your face again. And you guys, hope you're well. Well, we're both all locked down over here in Melbourne, but I've been watching what's been happening in England with the COVID cases, and uh, you guys are getting hit pretty hard at the moment. Yeah, we are. Yeah, it's uh, it's chaos over here at the moment. Nobody really knows what to do or what we're going to be doing next. So taking each day as it comes. Um, you know, as far as shooting goes, competitive shooting, we're still going at the moment, and hopefully we can continue to do so. Um, you know, we've got quite a few guidelines that we have to follow and respect, obviously. So if, um, you know, all being well, we can carry on doing that and continue enjoying the sport. To qualify for this week of um, Champions Week, you have had to have won an Olympic medal, which you obviously won a gold one, and you've also had to have won a world championship. And in sporting, I think, just in FITAS and English sporting, I think I stopped counting at about nine. Is that right? I think you've won four... FITAS and five World English, is that correct? Yeah, I think that's correct. And then there's a, there's a few others, uh, juniors and stuff like that as well. But well, Let's start there because the first time I met you, you were just a young boy. You were in Mount Gambier here in Australia at the World FITAS titles, 1994. Your father, Bruce, was the manager of the team. Um, and he actually introduced me to you. And uh, I did watch you shoot around and you devastated the juniors uh, that year to win the world title. And then you were known, obviously, as a sporting shooter. You were brought up as a sporting shooter. And a lot of people then knew you as a, a double trap shooter. Um, 96 at the Olympic Games, the first time I saw you seriously shoot at Olympic level, you made the final. And that's not what I remember of the Olympic final. You did an amazing job to get there, but you were shooting the most clapped out Keeman that I've ever seen in my life. It was stuck <laughs> together with bits of electrical tape. Um, whatever happened to that gun? I was hoping you would bring it to Sydney because I knew <laughs> it was quite not have lasted that long. Where is it? Um, I sold it to a mate of mine. I don't think he's got it anymore. I don't know what happened to it after that. But uh, yeah, you're right. It was stuck together with electrical tape. The only reason being was about, um, I don't know, two weeks before the actual Olympics, I dropped it on a concrete floor. Um, I, I reached into the back of the car to get some ammo out. And for some reason, I, I, it just slipped out of my hand and it fell on the floor and cracked stop. So, uh, yeah, that was as good a fix as it was going to get in that kind of space of time. But it held together for the day, so that was, that was what happened. <laughs> going forward to the 2000 Olympics, uh, you came out and did some training with Russell. And from memory, you went out on a boat with Brian, Russell's dad. And he said up until the day he died, his biggest regret was not making sure that that boat sank and if it didn't sink that he didn't throw you overboard i know I, i've never been so glad to step foot back onto dry land after that trip <laughs> it was literally i thought we were going to drown 10 miles off the coast of melbourne or wherever we were for people that um, don't know the story, my father had a brand new fishing boat and I wasn't that big on fishing, but Rich and Ian Coley, your coach of uh, the English team or the British team at the time were there training with me and Brian convinced you two to go out fishing with him, but he forgot to put the plug in the brand new boat and you get out in the middle of the sea and it took a lot of water. I said to Brian, I just gave you one job, Brian, just one job. <laughs> 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 Well, well, we'll get to the Sydney Olympics shortly, but you you shot very well in the lead up to the Olympic Games. So one of the events that I remember was back in Atlanta. I, I'm thinking it was the 97 or 98 World Cup. Um, and you shot 145 in qualification, and I think you shot 48 or 49 in the final. It was That, to me, really made me aware that you'd arrived, even though... To make an Olympic final in 96 was a tremendous effort. But I still think that day really showed me that you were, you'd were you worked double trap out. Did, was that a defining moment for you, that World Cup? 
Yeah, it was. Three or four months before that, started work. And that was the first major international event that I'd shot under his kind of guidance, as it were, as a psych, you know, a sports psychologist. From then on, you know, it just kind of all fell into place a little bit more. Um, can I just take you back for your transition from sporting into double trap? Was there a defining moment at which point you decided to cross over or to do both? I first shot double trap at Ian Coley's place in, I think, maybe 93 or 94. And they had it as a pool shoot at a side event for a fit ass shoot. Um, and there was me and Mickey Rouse that kind of, you know, shot it for two days straight. And we would alternate, you know, they were paying out like every 25 entries. They would only shoot, I think we shot 15 pairs on a round just for something to do. Um, and they were paying out every 20 or 30 shooters. And it was either me or Mickey that won it pretty much every time. Um, and then Ian Cody was like, come on, you've got to come shoot the selection shoots and try it and give it a go. And it just, that's how it sort of started for me. I qualified for the British team to go to the World Championships in Finland, I think in 90, it must have been 95. And that was the last available quota place for Atlanta in 96. Um, and British shooting wanted me to go in the junior team. And I said, no, can I go in the senior team and try and win the quota place? Um, and I think I finished fourth or fifth in the senior. So I won the quota place. So really that was the, the proper sort of start of it for me on the double trap. That was an excellent call on your part. In terms of the gun, <laughs> did you just use the same gun um, when you were shooting both disciplines? No, I had a, um, I had a dedicated trap gun, came trap gun to start with, um, which was, um, it was just, you know, a, a bit of a, a different setup to my sport, just a bit higher. But in effect, it was the same gun a gun, really. Okay, so same length barrels, just a little bit higher in the cone. Yeah, that's it. Rich, in the introduction, I mentioned that I always found you to be one of the most beautiful shots to watch. You make things look very easy. And in Double Trap, you, you were one of the first guys I saw really perfect the art of virtually spot shooting the first target. But you had a technique that was a little bit different, even though you were left-handed. You shot right-left on every station, didn't you? No matter where you were, you shot the right target first. So even over on station four and five, on program A, where you've got a high target and a low left target, you managed to be able to shoot right, left. Why did you shoot that way? For me, it was the, way of, uh, the best way to keep the gun movement right down. If I was to shoot from pegs four and five, uh, left, right, I would always overshoot the second target. So I just persisted with trying to shoot the right bird first. So in effect, all I was doing was, was shooting the first target and just a tiny upward movement to the second shot. So did you move the barrel at all for the first target or did you spot shoot the first target? Uh, there was a tiny bit of movement, but not a lot. Not a lot, yeah, if I can help it. So basically, you were just really lazy. You just <laughs> wanted to have as little movement as possible. And well, You've got it. It was an unusual technique to watch because obviously the people that are watching this broadcast might not understand double trap, but in doubles, whether it's down the line doubles or double trap, most people consider to shoot the right target first on stations one, two and three, and then the left target first on stations four and five. But I've got to admit, after I watched you shooting at that World Cup in Atlanta, I come home and tried it and I couldn't hit anything. So I quickly <laughs> got that out of my head. But it was always good to see different people from around the world try it. Now, you went to the Sydney Olympics, though, with a Beretta. When did you make the transition from the Keeman to a Beretta? I believe it was late 98, early 99. And a memory, I can't, I couldn't put a date on it, but it was around that time. 32 inch barrel. ASC 90, yeah, black, black action, 32 inch barrel with T chokes. What chokes did you use? For doubles, I used quarter, three quarter. In my Cayman, in the early days, I used to shoot three quarter full, um, but I, I um, as time went on, I lost my kind of nerve with that a little bit, so I opened up to quarter, three quarter. Yeah. Um, and I shoot. I used to shoot eights in the first barrel, seven and a half in the second. So that was pretty much it. 
And your point of aim for sporting and double trap? For double trap, it was probably 70-30. And for sporting, it would be 50-50, 60-40, something like that, to be honest. So pretty um, flat for sporting. We'll talk about the Sydney Olympics, obviously. Um, I thought that after the time you shot with me here in Melbourne, that you were on fire. You were really starting to shoot some long breaks. You were hitting a lot in a row. Um, it was an interesting day, obviously, me being the hometown favourite, and the English aren't really well liked here, but you did have a lot of English supporters in the crowd, I've got to say. But um, People ask me, and we've just had the 20th anniversary of that competition, People ask me, what do I remember most about it? And um, I'm not sure what your memory of the day is, but I can remember that grandstand moving considerably when all the people stood up at the same time. And I can remember people screaming and yelling. And I, I at one stage, had to tell them to shut up, but I didn't realise it was about to fall down on them. I thought they were <laughs> screaming and yelling because they didn't like the prom I was shooting off with. Um, uh, and I say that facetiously. Obviously, it changed your life. You um, won an Olympic gold medal. And I've asked Derek Mine this question, who's trying to go to win his first Olympic medal at, at next year's Tokyo Games. Would you swap an Olympic gold medal for nine sporting world championships? 100%. <laughs> you didn't even hesitate on that. Yeah, no. I mean, that, that day, you know, you, you said it, it changed my life. Um, and if if somebody said to me, would I swap, you know, all my world championships for another gold medal, I wouldn't hesitate to do it. Um, for me, it's, um, it was a moment in time that opened a lot of doors, you know, and it, it's not about, it's not just about shooting, it's about the places you go, the people you meet and the events you go to and, and just life in general after that moment. You know, I mean, you've been through it, so you know, you know, you know exactly what I'm talking about in that respect. Um, so, yeah, for me, it was it was a great moment, and hopefully, you know, it kind of put pretty shooting on the map again after a long break of um, of no Olympic medals in the shooting sports. Can I just go back a little bit though? I mean, I touched on it earlier, and I've never asked you this. Was it Bruce who taught you to shoot? Who taught you to shoot the technique that you used? Because it's such an effortless technique. And I've often told people, if you want to watch someone shoot, go and watch a Richard Folds video. But so Dad, Dad always shot game. He never shot clays or competitive clays. You know, he might he might shoot a few clays just to to have a bit of a practice for a game day, but he wouldn't ever shoot competitively. But um, he he bought me some lessons when I was, I think, eight or nine years old for a birthday present with a friend of his who gave me a few lessons. And then shortly after that, we moved house. We moved like an hour or so away from, from where we were. And I got then uh, taken on by a guy called Steve Nutbeam, who taught me pretty much to shoot all of my sporting stuff from then on for the next four or five years. Um, but as far as double trap goes, really, I kind of, I mean, with a bit of guidance from Ian Coley, but I kind of learned it on my own. Um, and, it, you know, if you, if you shoot enough of it over a short period of time, you know, look at Pete Wilson, really. He, look at him if you want to watch someone who's caught up on a lot of shooting in a very short space of time and you sort of teach yourself to do it. But for me, um, you know, I would learn by watching others and try and kind of pick up on good points and, and knock off bad points on what they were doing. But for me, really, I was, I would say, probably 90% self-taught on the double. If I could just ask you about when you first started as well. I know that you're left-handed. Did you take to the gun naturally left-handed? Did you automatically put it up? Or was there some sort of assessment done in terms of what was best for you? No, it just felt natural left-handed. I mean, I'm left-handed, you know, with most things. So um, that, luckily for me, I was left-eye dominant, left-handed. So it was, a, you know, a, a straightforward choice. Rich, you moved on past the Sydney Olympics. You, um, you didn't give up sporting by any means, even though... At that stage, you didn't know you were going to have a home Olympics in 2012. But in 2002, it was one of your best years in sporting. You won both the World FITAS and the World English Sporting 
championship. Um, it obviously never affected you swapping between disciplines. Do you think one fed off the other? I think so. And, f um, you know, for me, I, my first love is sporting. But obviously then the intention of the Olympics was to go there and, and try and succeed and win a medal. Um, and that was the pure pull for that kind of side event for me. I always used to shoot my best at both disciplines when I was shooting both. And then leading up towards London in 2012, um, <clears throat> the pressure was put on me to ease off the sporting. And I just, I got a little bit tired of the doubles, just shooting that all the time. Um, you know, for me, you would know as well as anyone that you need to be fresh and keen and to be shooting a lot of competitions. There's no good just going train, 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 train. Um, for me, I enjoyed the sporting competitions and I could do that twice a week if I wanted to. Go and put myself in that pressure environment. Even if it's only a local event, you're still, you know, I hate losing. So I would go there to try and win every time I went out to shoot and compete. I think that the lack of events leading up to London in 2012 probably just took a little bit of my edge off of me where I wasn't competing in major sporting championships on a weekly basis. So, um, but yeah, you're right. I, I always seem to shoot my best when I was doing both quite intensively, but I don't think it ever affected me in either way. You know, I could switch from one to the other without too much trouble. It's great to hear you confirm what a lot of other champions have already said, and that is the importance of competition and, you know, that desire to win. In terms of practice, when you did practice, was there a particular amount of training that you liked to put in? And when you transferred between sporting and doubles, did you have a certain amount of rounds you needed to put to a particular discipline to be able to... Um, so for doubles, I would shoot, I would train probably three, four days a week, but only shoot a couple of hundred targets. So I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't stand there from dawn till dusk and shoot myself to a standstill. Um, and the same with sporting, you know, I wouldn't need to do a lot. In fact, I very rarely ever shot any training for sporting. I would rather go and compete somewhere. But, you know, everyone's different. Some people need to go out there and shoot hundreds of targets a day to train, you know, to be at their top level. And other people, you know, it's such an individual kind of regime, I think, on the training side of things. I've often told people, Rich, my success in a lot of the events that I competed in was largely due to the fact that I had Michael Diamond beside me so often because uh, he was such a good yardstick. In England, you've had George Digweed. You had him, obviously, forever as a sporting shooter, but you also had him early on as a double trap shooter. I mean, we, we've spoken with this... Uh, about George's famous first double trap World Cup that he won with a world record. And um, he would have pushed you a bit, though. You, you turned out to be a lot better double trap shooter than him. But in the early days, he would have been... You'd, it'd nearly be a nightmare. You'd leave the sporting range and then you'd have to front up and find him at the, <laughs> the double trap range. But um, can you tell us about George's influence on your career? Not just in doubles, obviously, but the fact that you've had someone of that ability always to measure yourself by. Yeah, and I think, um, like you compared yourself in, with Michael Diamond in that situation, I think if you, if you have someone of that ability that you need to go out and beat on a regular basis, then, God, it makes you try that much harder. Um, and, you know, like you say, right from the word go, George has been there. Um, everybody's been trying to beat him for years. Um, you know, luckily enough, I've been successful on a good few occasions um, and, you know, sort of had him over once or twice. But um, for me, my biggest drive was I hated losing. So um, for me to go out, like I said, even if it's just a local club shoot on a Sunday or if it's a British Open or a World Championship, for me, I wanted to go there and win. Um, and no matter who was there, and you, you knew that if you were competing against someone like George, you know, and now there's 25 other people, probably more in the UK, that you, you could pick at a major event that on their day could win. 
Rich, um, I'll give you the tip. If you had have been on that bus in 1993 in Milan after George had won, which I unfortunately was sitting behind him, I know exactly what you're saying. <laughs> because George, um, and I say that light heartedly because obviously I've got on very well with him, but what you're saying there, it's nearly a stereotype of what George thinks as well. I mean, because he hates losing also. So when you get two people that hate losing a match. It's like putting a magnet trying to get, get it to join, but uh, it clearly helped you both because the two of you, if you look through the record books in sporting, you two just dominated. Um, and, and many times I bet you've won it and George has come second or vice versa. Uh, I bet that's happened on more than one occasion, but the next time you go back, he's got to jump that little bit higher or you had to jump yeah, that little bit higher. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I'm sure that in the, this would ring true in many sports across the world in, you know, different kind of walks of life. Um, you know, you get two people who just want to beat each other, um, you know, and as soon as you see their name on the entry list or you see them turn up at the shoot, then you think, right, you know, uh, you know you've know, got to put the effort in today. And that's the difference between what makes a champion and a good shot. I, for me, that's what I feel makes a difference. But it was a healthy rivalry, though, Rich. That's, I, I know at times um, it might have been strained, but you'd look back and say it was a healthy rivalry. Oh, 100%. You know, and I've got you know, the utmost respect for George, and you know, hopefully he has for me too. Um, and you know, we've both had our, our time at the top. And you know, if, if I never won another shoot from now on, you know, I would die a happy man. Look, you say that the main thing is that you hated losing, okay? And I think there's a lot of people at the range that hate losing. I feel like there's got to be something a little bit more. I know that you, you know, what do you do or what can you tell some of these hungry people that are nipping away trying to get, you know, to that next level in their sport, you know, or the people that were just making the finals and not getting the medals that don't like losing, you know, what is your little bit of advice to help you actually achieve your goal of not losing or winning? I mean, that's the, that's the million dollar question really, isn't it? To be honest, I think if people are hungry enough then and, and patient, then their time will come. If you kind of break it down into um, three areas, you have to learn a technique to shoot and then you have to learn to win at a... A registered event level and then you have to learn to win at a championship event level and I think those three steps are obviously the first two are you know the, the two of the easier steps to achieve but it's breaking through to that third step um, and I think if you have the dedication and the will to win and you know you can afford to put the time and the effort into it then it will pay off it's just a case of you know not trying to rush it and give up because your time will come. Great advice. Yeah, it is. It's excellent advice. Rich, I want to ask you some questions that I've asked some of the other uh, people that we've had on the show. The first one's this. It's a hypothetical question. Um, let's say that you took the 10 best British VTAS sporting shooters to a 200 target competition in Italy. And the United States turned up with their 10 best at the moment. As of 2020, their 10 best FITAS shooters to shoot against the British team over 200 targets. In the year 2020, who would win? It depends if you wanted to take the top 10 British shooters or the top 10 shooters who shoot for the British team because no, they're two no. very different things. <laughs> and it's funny because you sort of touched on a little bit with what George said. No, the 10 best... Because George said the trouble we have in Britain if we took the 10 best British shooters, only three of us had come home, with seven of us would stab each other in the back. Now, if you could get the 10 best British VTAS shooters right now, forget them right. being the British team, just add their scores up. Are the 10 best British VTAS shooters at the moment better than the 10 best American VTAS shooters? Um, I'm going to stick my neck on the line and say no. I think America would probably bend us over at the moment, to be fair. Why has it changed so quickly? Because 20 years ago, Rich, you wouldn't have even, you would have laughed if I even had brought that question up. But 
you know, and, and what you've said is pretty much what everyone else has said. I'll give you the tip. Um, why? Why has it changed so quickly over there? And you've been over there. You, I see you even won the, I think you won the US Open there in 2014. You've spent a bit of time over there and you've seen them grow. Why have they grown so fast? I think the, the main reason um, that they have caught up over a, a very short period of time is their professionalism towards the sport. The Americans are incredibly dedicated to clay target shooting in a massive way and in a very serious way. Um, you know, their events, their venues, their, um, not so much the, the targets that they shoot, but their, their sort of professionalism towards the way they apply themselves is totally different to the way that we do back here. Um, and I think in Britain, it's always going to be an amateur sport. You know, there's always going to be the element of, oh, well, if I don't win today, then it's not the end of the world. And that, you know, which is a contrary to what I've just said about me hating losing. I think if, um, if more people really focused on what made them win, then I think we could flip that back to uh, being in favour of the British team over the American team. But the way the Americans have come on in the last 10 or 15 years is, you know, is really something else, to be fair to them. I'm sure the pro circuit they introduced over there, not that it's going at the moment, but that helped. But George alluded to the fact that in Britain now, a lot of the competitions are split. You don't shoot off. You And he said 20 years ago, he used to have to shoot off two or three times a weekend. But now most of the normal competitions are just split at the end of the day. And he said that's become a big factor in a lot of people not knowing how to even win a shoot off because they shoot so little shoot offs now in Britain. Is that something that you see as a problem? Yeah. Um, if you, if you kind of wind the clock back sort of 20, 25 years, um, there was, there's a club called Southdown Gun Club. Um, and I used to shoot there fairly regularly. And at the end of the day, there used to be a shoot off, you know, quite often for a high gun. There would be a compact pull shoot. You would shoot off for that. There would be a 25 bird skeet competition. You know, you would have everyone who shot 25 straight shooting off for that. There would be a 10 bird pull shoot. You know, quite often you wouldn't finish shooting until it was dark and you could see the flames coming out at the end of the gun. And there was 10 people trying to see if you'd broke the target or not. But putting yourself in that pressure environment, like I said, um, a few minutes ago about um, when I was not shooting as much sporting in 2012. If you don't put yourself in those pressure situations, you don't learn to win. No matter how small the shoot-off is, you know, if it, if it was me and George shooting off for a 10-bird pool shoot for 50 quid, you still want to beat that person for the 50 quid. And, you know, you can then translate that into a shoot-off for a world championship because you're shooting off against the same person. So really, it's, it's that mental strength in those situations that makes a difference between a winner and a loser. That's how you know we shooters have issues, because when the prize money is less than the amount that you got to spend in cartridges to win the event, and you still are stubborn <laughs> and keep at it just for the win, that goes uh, 100%. Up, you know, yeah. the desire, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah, too right. Rich, another question, and I know you're not involved in IWS anymore, but you had a lot to do with it. For I think you went to five Olympic Games. I know you're in the finals of three of them, so I'm thinking five. Yeah. Um, we've, we've got a lot of people that question the selection policies of different countries. And in the United States, they just have the Olympic qualifiers over 500 targets, and the best two people go if there are two slots up for grabs. Um, and this year, Kim Rowe didn't make it. I mean, she, Kim's one of the greatest ever shooters, didn't make the Olympic team. Two girls shot better than her and, and knocked her out. And in Italy, the Olympic team is picked by a coach. Um, and you'd argue that they've, they've had the best success ever at Olympic level. Have you got a philosophy, if you were the coach of, or, or the, the boss of British shooting, what, what is the best way to pick an Olympic team to win a gold medal? God, that's a risky question. <laughs> um, I'm asking. I, I mean, you. <laughs> yeah, Vince. So, if you won the quota place, you would go. You know, 
far in the fact that you didn't have a massive loss of form in the six months leading up to the Olympics. To me, if if you can win a quota place on a world level, then get it right on the day of the Olympics and you'll, you'll win a medal. Um, I mean, you know that by the time you actually get to the Olympics, you've only got a minimum number of people there. And in reality, probably 50% of the people that are there are capable of winning a medal, if not a gold medal. Yeah. Um, so really, if you, if you can get through the qualification process to earn your place at the Olympics, then I feel that that should be the person that goes. Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting scenario. I mean, the, the trouble, I guess, with that system, if you guys walk out and win the first two World Cups in the Olympic cycle, that pretty much ends it um, for everybody else because there are no more quotas that you can win. You can only win two. So yeah. then, then I guess the people below you have got to sit out of the sport until the next Olympic cycle then your argument's going to be, well, they should have won the first one that I won. So that, that, that's the argument. It's a tough question, I know, and there's no correct answer. I, I, but I do like asking people like yourself that, and it, it's just very varied in people's responses to it. So I'm curious now that you've started with a Cayman, you went to a Beretta, and now you shoot a Caesar Guarini. Um, Tell me the differences between those three brands of guns. How have you enjoyed swapping over to the Caesar? I've absolutely loved the transition from Beretta to Caesar Green, to be honest. Um, it was 2013 that I swapped over. And really, from a sporting point of view, I think it's probably the finest gun that I've ever shot. What um, are you using? Which one is it? It's the Invictus 5, which is what I've shot now for the last four years, I think. Um, if you look at my averages over the last three years, my sporting percentage has gone up since I've been using that gun. Um, and, you know, I can't put my finger on the exact reason, but the hand, you know, it handles so well. Um, it's quite a lot lighter than my DT10 that I finished off at Beretta with. Still a 32-inch barrel? 32-inch barrel, um, but quite light in the barrel. I mean, I think the barrel weight was around 1,500, something like that. So quite light for a 32-inch gun. And I've just recently had it Teague choked because I shot fixed choke for years, three-quarter and full. But now I've got it teed. Um, the main reason being is that you'll see more and more targets on a sporting course now that are thrown under 20 metres and it's particularly like a rabbit target um, and you know if you're shooting a, a three-quarter or full choke at a rabbit at 15 yards then you only need it to bounce two inches and you're going to miss it so I've kind of lost my nerve with uh, with a full choke at that range to be fair. So just confirming when you get to the stand you look at the presentation and then change your chokes accordingly to the range of the turrets you're going to be shooting on that stand? Um... So I only really, I, I kind of go from one extreme to the other. I've got super cylinder, which um, I'll shoot at a, a close rabbit target or a close, you know, a target under 20 meters. Anything else I'll stick to what I know, you know, sort of three quarter and full, which um, I will shoot at, you know, pretty much everything else. But um, I do like the super cylinder choke now for something that's on the end of the gun. And if you're only looking at, trying to get yourself a half a percent or one percent extra at the end of the round then you only need a bad bounce on a rabbit at 20 yards and that's going to cause you the difference between you know it may be the difference between a world championship gold and silver speaking of that you said your averages are going up and that you i'm assuming you still hate losing um do you have current goals in sporting i'm yeah absolutely you know um World English, World Fitas next year, hopefully both back on the cards for us. Um, you know, stuff like the US Open and things like that. We love going over and shooting those. So there's still more than enough stuff for us to be doing internationally on the sporting circuit to keep us busy for the year. Rich, the last time I picked your gun up, um, I didn't have a shot of it because I thought as I picked it up out of the gun rack, I'd broken the front side off the gun but it didn't have one. Has it got one now? You, you, for a long time, you never had a front sight at all. Is that still the case? Never, 
Yeah, oh, I haven't had one for 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us why. I mean, a lot of the people that will watch this will now their jaws have hit the ground because you go to Japan and the front sights, they get them about that big and they have a fluorescent light inside them. But you've never shot a front sight. Uh, Tell us your reason behind that. Why do you need a front sight? Why do you need any sight on the rim of a gun? If it, if it fits you properly, you shouldn't be looking at the barrel. So that's my kind of theory behind it. And if you were to give a complete novice um, a, a gun, you know, an over and under with no sights on it, they wouldn't know any different. They would be aware of the barrel. As long as their head's mounted on the stock correctly, they'd be aware of the barrel, focus on the target. That's all you need to worry about. Do you pattern your guns, Rich, to see where they shoot? Not really. No. I mean, it, it, for me, if um, you know, if you're breaking the targets well, then it fits properly, and you're probably better off not knowing what the pattern looks like. To be fair. Well, I noticed you never seem to fluctuate in weight. You're looking as fit now as ever. Do you do anything in terms of your physical fitness, or you're just blessed? <laughs> Even or are you just keeping up with your good wife? Uh, yeah. Well, yeah, pretty much. Uh, but no, I. I haven't done any when I was when I was at my kind of um, my keenest. I was doing a bit of swimming, but this is 25 years ago. Um, so no, no, just running around after the kids and working at the shooting schools enough to keep me fit. Yeah, I know you've got a busy life with the kids, and I see a few of them are shooting a little bit now. Um, so it's a whole family sport now. Is that right? Yeah. Oh, uh, it's you know, there's you know more guns and shooting talk in our house than anything now. So. Um, you know, it's great. It's great for us because we're all keen on it. We all love it. And it's nice that we can kind of share our share our passion together. Rich, um, a serious question. I asked this to Derek Mine and I asked it to George. And you're, again, more than qualified to answer it. And now you own your own shooting ground. It may have happened to you. Um, one criticism people worldwide have of sporting clay events is the amount of cheating that goes on behind the scenes. Um, I don't want to talk about individuals. I don't want to talk about particular events, but it is a problem, isn't it? Is there something that you see that they could do to fix it? So the new, since we've had lockdown over here and then shooting has been reintroduced, there is now a, a system where competitors don't touch the scorecards. Um, so the scorecards stay with the referees on the station and then someone will run around and pick them up periodically during the day on a sporting event. Um, that is a much safer way of um, ensuring that various forms of cheating don't go on. Um, but I think until uh, until you can introduce some form of electronic live scoring system, then the, you know it's. And then the problem is getting the referees that can work it. Um, you know, getting referees full stop sometimes is difficult. So getting referees to be able to work a computerized system and obviously the expense of that um, is another step forward yet. But with a new system that we're using now in the UK on registered events, um, competitors are never handling the scorecard. And as long as you've got a referee who, um, you know, who won't be bullied or won't be badgered into letting somebody shoot the target again if they try and call it a no bird, then I think, you know, this is kind of the, hopefully the first step forward in in knocking some of that kind of foul play on the head. Rich, a lot of Australians last year went over to Ireland to shoot in the World English Sporting, the other version, there's two World English Sportings, I know, but you were there, but you didn't shoot. Um, you set the targets and the Aussies that were there come back and said they were the best targets they've ever shot at. So that that's big praise. Obviously, um, you set the targets and, and there'd be no one better, I would think, to do that. But do you enjoy that role? Yeah, I love it. Um, so I've, I've done a few now. I did the uh, the US Open in 2017 at Big Red Oak in Georgia, and I loved it. That was, you know, it's such a pretty place. The train's fabulous there, uh, and the people to work with are great. And, you know, the same in Ireland. The train was fantastic. Um, and the good thing about Ireland was that it had never, ever had a clay target thrown on it before. So it wasn't as if you were going to a shooting ground and you're trying to reinvent the wheel for the hundredth time. You know, everything was new, fresh terrain for everybody. Nobody knew what they were going to do when they walked around the corner to the next station. So um, it's, you know, it's a side of the sport that I really enjoy. I love it. 
but it means you can't shoot in the competition. Um, does that mean that you're not, you don't have that same desire? If you go to a world sporting event and don't shoot in it, people think you're crazy. Hopefully people appreciate the effort and the work that you put into the events. And I think a lot of people um, should have a go at trying to set a course because it's not easy um, and trying to get it right is difficult. And I don't think there's ever been anybody who's set a perfect course. There's always been something somewhere that somebody could pick holes in. But, um, you know, it's a challenge that I enjoy. I wouldn't want to do um, too many, but, you know, maybe one big event a year, you know, is is nice to do. Um, and, you know, it's just a different side of the sport, really, that I enjoy kind of putting something back into, too. You were never really keen to get on a plane and travel. You always used to complain about the fact that you may have to come across the hemisphere line and come down to Australia to shoot because it's such a long way. But you mentioned before that you went to the States and set the targets there. Um, is the state something that interests you to spend more time in? Uh, when the Pro Tour was on, I half expected you may even pop up there and have a shot in it. Um, you Obviously, they like you over there and you like going there. Is it something that they can expect to see more of you in the future? We love going over there. And Tanya went over there this year. She went and did all the, uh, the big Florida shoots in February and March. Um, so she went over there and, and shot probably 5,000 competition targets in as many weeks. Um, you know, the atmosphere over there is great. Everyone's really welcoming. Um, the venues are fabulous. The tournaments themselves are great. You know, what's not to like, really? Yeah. Um, and we try and go, you know, we try and go at least once a year, um, even if it's not to a World English or a World Fit House. We try and go to a regional or a US Open or the Nationals or something. Um, you know, it's just, it is clay target shooting mecca over there in the US. It'll fatten you up a bit if you spend too much time there, mate. You want to be very careful. <laughs> just um, before we wind this up, tell us how Owls Lodge is going, your shooting ground. Owls Lodge is going really well, thank you. Yeah, no, it's, um, it's gone from strength to strength over the last few years. Um, and we're now doing more and more competition events. Um, people seem to be enjoying it. And, you know, it's something that we enjoy, you know, hosting the events, running the events. All the families involved, I see even Lauren's involved now in um, getting all the, all the day's activities off. Uh, your young bloke, Charlie, I'm very keen. How's he going to go? Charlie loves shooting. Yeah, he's, he's mad for it. Um, he, he's not overly fussed on the clays at the moment. You know, he'll quite happily go, if we go game shooting or something like that, he's, you know, he's always the first one out the door. But... I think if, because he's, he's only, he'll be 13 next month, so still time for him to properly get the bug. But, um, you know, he'll, he'll not pick the gun up for a month and then he'll go out and he'll go around 100 bird shoot and he'll shoot like a 70. Um, you know, so I think when, when he gets that hunger for it, hopefully over the next two or three years, then, um, you know, hopefully he can, he can get, the, uh, get the ability to, you know, to, get stuck in and, and carry on the, the sport as a family member. I'm not sure there's that big of a window. There are girls. Maybe he'll follow in dance. Oh, don't, and yeah, no, don't, no. <laughs> now, um, Rich, a lot of people don't know this trivia fact, but it is a, it is a fact. You weren't the first world champion in your family, were you? No. Um, <laughs> my, well, my brother, um, apparently he won a lawnmower racing world championship in about 1980 something your brother was the world lawnmower racing champion that is something rich it's <laughs> been fantastic to catch up with you you look tremendous um i hope things settle down in england so you can let us aussies back over there because i'd love to come back and spend some time then i'd definitely come along and uh, have a shot at ours lodge but it, it's been a pleasure to talk to you and your memories and your career's far from over i know i know there's a lot to go in the uh into your resume still to come. But uh, thanks for the insight into how you conduct yourself. You've been an absolute credit to the sport. People look up to you and think that they're very grateful to be involved in a sport where they've got people like you in it. Well, thank you for coming from someone like you, you guys. That means a lot. So thank you very much. Thanks, Rich. It's been thank great you. to catch up with you. Cool. All right, take care.